this week on Vaticano. 36 new Swiss guards take an oath to risk their lives to defend the Pope. Come with us into the Pontifical North American College and meet benefactors and students that unite to live out the gospel and learn about the secret of holiness from St. Maximilian Maria Kolbe. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Every year on May the 6th, the new Swiss guards are sworn in at the Vatican. A total of 36 recruits from Switzerland will take the oath this year. The smallest army in the world has been protecting the Holy Father and his residence since 1506. However, the Pope's elite troops faced their greatest test on May the 6th, 1527, when Emperor Charles V unleashed Lance Connect mercenaries on Rome and devastated the Eternal City during the so-called Sack of Rome. At the last moment, the Swiss Guards were able to bring Pope Clement VII to safety via a secret passage into Castel Sant'Angelo. Brave and faithful is the motto of the troops. Bravely and faithfully, 189 guardsmen resisted the superior force of the looters. Only 42 men survived. To become a Swiss guard, one must be a Swiss citizen and have completed basic military service in Switzerland. At the swearing-in ceremony, recruits wear the so-called Grand Gala uniform and solemnly swear on the Corps' flag. It's an oath that binds them to loyalty to the Holy Father and all his rightful successors, according to the motto, brave and faithful. In addition to the oath to protect the life of the Pope, if necessary, with their own lives, the guards also perform many representative duties. They keep watch over all official entrances to Vatican City and are available to visitors from all over the world for information about the Vatican. Pontifical mission societies are celebrating the 200th anniversary of their foundation as the Association of the Propagation of the Faith. At the same time, they're preparing for the beatification of their foundress, Pauline Jaricot, on May the 22nd in her native city of Lyon, France. Pauline was a laywoman who started and shaped the biggest missionary society in the world. Today, it's comprised of 354,000 missionaries and 3 million catechists in 130 countries. The president of the Pontifical Mission Societies, Archbishop Giovanni Pietro D'Altoso, says that since their foundation, the mission hasn't changed. By the mission, we mean to strengthen a local church and the Mission Society has always had the task to establish the structures of the local church, to finance, to strengthen them. And the structures of the local church means for us building up churches, cathedrals, and providing help to the local bishop so that he can manage the diocese easily. Of course, we support monasteries and the seminaries as well. We finance almost all of the seminaries in the mission countries, so we support all important projects for the strengthening of the local churches. So uh, all das, was zur Stärkung der Lokalkirche wichtig ist.
Hello, and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. Pope Francis changed church law on the rules for dismissal from religious institutes. He defined the crime of abuse as being a crime against human life, dignity, and freedom, further denoting its gravity. Bishop Paolo Martinelli was appointed as the new Apostolic Vicar of Southern Arabia. He replaces Bishop Paul Hinder, who has reached the age limit of 80 in a very important and delicate post. Like his predecessor, Bishop Martinelli is a member of the Order of the Capuchin Friars Minor. The president of Gabon, Ali Bongo Ondimba, visited the Holy Father this week. They spoke about the contribution of the Catholic Church in the field of education. It was often Catholic missionaries who helped to establish a school system in many African countries. Pope Francis called on the faithful to pray the rosary for peace every day, especially in light of the ongoing violence in Ukraine. Throughout the month of May, the Vatican will host two weekly occasions for prayer in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Cardinal Angelo Camastri will lead a candlelight rosary procession around St. Peter's Square on Saturdays, and on Wednesdays, there will be a prayer walk in the Basilica. On May 15th, Pope Francis will name 10 new saints. One of the new saints will be the French explorer turned missionary Charles de Foucault, who will be canonized by the Holy Father in St. Peter's Square. It is the first canonization since the beginning of the pandemic, and tens of thousands of faithful are expected to participate in this event. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. I'm Hannah Brockhouse for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. now, maybe never before in our lifetimes, is it more important for us to have some uniquely trained holy men, and we think that uh, the Pontifical North American College is no better place for that to happen. Unlike the other part of the spectrum where so much negativity is always exposed, particularly about the Catholic Church, this place is just one of such hope. We're here at the North American College in the heart of Rome, a place of hope, a place where young seminarians are educated to become priests in the United States. And there are many people supporting this cause because otherwise it would not be possible. The Pontifical North American College welcomes its benefactors once a year to thank them for their support. Seminarians serve the donors at this event and share their Roman experience as well as their vocational journeys. My name is Justin Echevarria. I'm a seminarian at the Pontifical North American College and I study for the Archdiocese of Portland in Oregon. I am a third year theologian. God willing will be ordained to the diaconate in just five months and to the priesthood, God willing, in two years. The Pontifical North American College provides formation to approximately 300 seminarians and priests each year, offering a unique experience for them to study at the heart of the church. What would you say are the most important things that seminarians here should be taking home, should be learning? The wholeness of the church throughout the world and the value of the different parts of the church and what they contribute to each other. When you're going to school here, when you're working here, which I did along the way at the, at the Vatican, you have an experience with other people from other countries and you come to realize that the church is rich in talent and gifts in knowledge from people from many, many places. It just helps you to have a, a better perspective on the world and you bring that with you into your ministry. God has been very good to us. 
and one of those ways in which he has been good to us is through you. It is his gift to host you again this evening. What would you say is the most important thing for seminarians that they should take back from an experience like this being educated here at Rome also to become good priests and good shepherds? I think really what they get is to learn about the church governance and hierarchy which is headquartered here. And there are a lot of Americans in the Roman Curia today, so there's a lot of friends for them to associate with. I think they also develop those relationships with each other. And when they go back to the States and, and maybe they have a question about something that's happening in their particular parish or community, they know others that they can call on, whether they're in their area or somewhere else in the U.S., they can reach out and say, you know, what would you do? How would you handle this situation? One of the supporters that we also interviewed around the director's dinner, she said that for her, this is a place of hope. We're obviously coming out of some, some rather dark days in the church. The fact that men are still willing to lay down their lives for Christ and enter um, seminary formation, um, to follow that through, it can be a four, five, six year journey. That's a tremendous sign of hope in today's culture. Christ said, do not be afraid, and you know, I'll be with you till the end of the time, but I think he knew that it would take men of courage, and women of course, uh, to bring that sense of hope to fruition. WTN, I wish you a cordial welcome. From the rooftops, proclaiming the message of the gospel in modern times. On April 27th, the EWTN Vatican Bureau hosted its fourth edition of Roman Nights, an event series that brings together experts from different professional backgrounds to discuss relevant topics of life and faith. And I'd like to look for a moment when the Christians first emerged into this Roman Empire, this world of men becoming gods, and they needed to proclaim the gospel and they wanted to use pictures because the Romans, the Gentiles, they were people who understood pictures. And so from the very beginning, from 200 years in, the Christians began to think about how to recount a story through these images. Art historian and author Elizabeth Lev was joined by Father Jose Maria Laporte, a professor at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross, and Michael Warsaw, CEO of EWTN. All three agreed that the church mustn't be afraid to make use of the various communications media to proclaim the gospel. The pandemic has, in a way, um, been a wonderful opportunity to show the, the breadth and the depth uh, of Catholic media and the ability of uh, the church and Catholic entities to use media platforms uh, to reach out and to reach people. You know, we made a special emphasis on uh, liturgy and devotions and uh, things that would, would really support people in, in this moment of need. Have web content. The CEO of EWTN said that the pandemic showed the importance of media as being a way for the church to connect to people. One of the things that we heard from people uh, in, in all corners of the world was just how in this moment of despair, in this moment of loneliness and isolation, how coming to the EWTN platforms, whether they were watching television or listening to radio or watching a social media feed or a, a live stream, whatever way they, they joined us. They felt a connection to their fellow Catholics and people around the world. And so in a way, it, it I think helped to build a certain sense of community um, in, in, in a very dark hour, in a very uncertain hour that really I think helped to give people hope in that time. The people go 
In this panel discussion, it became clear that priests also have a responsibility to use media for good. What is important for somebody who is going to be a priest um, to learn about communication? I would say uh, conviction, learning, and painting. That when we talk about the faith, we are talk talking about the human being. The sense the image of, of, of God, the human being is image of God, the, the faith fits perfectly. And my feeling is that we need to rethink how, in some ways, to paint the faith and to communicate it again. Media platforms play a key part in the process of re-evangelization, the participants said. In this age of big headlines and clickbait, it's hard to proclaim the truth, but Christian media in particular have an important role to play here. Most technologies are, are neither good nor bad. You know, they're, they're neutral, most. And I think what people need is that real human connection and, and, and true community. The evening concluded with real human connection and true community during a light reception where further ideas were shared and discussed. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. If we do not have Catholic media, our shrines will one day be empty. These were the prophetic words of Maximilian Maria Kolbe, a saint who launched a Catholic magazine 100 years ago that's still thriving today. The guardian of the shrine of Our Lady of the Immaculate, Father Mariusz Szwowik, welcomes us at the heart of St. Maximilian's spirituality. Uh, Nepokalanov is uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, Franciscan friary uh, in the world. Uh, Nepokalanov was started uh, by St. Maximilian Kolbe in 1927. Uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe had uh, great devotion to Our Lady and he wanted to win the world to Christ, to Our Lady. He uh, wanted to do this uh, by printing different magazines. He started a monthly magazine uh, the night of the Immaculate. He started this in Krakow, next in Grodno, uh, and finally here uh, in Niepokalanów. He wanted to print the night of in the Immaculate uh, and he created uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, printing press uh, in Poland and in the world. Before the war, he published almost one million monthly uh, magazine. It was a great job. Uh, Sir Maximilian also uh, started here uh, Radio Niepokalanów and uh, school uh, for boys who wanted to be priests, to be uh, missionaries. The idea of the journal was born to support the apostolate of the Militia of the Immaculata, which St. Maximilian founded while studying in Rome. The international director of the Militia of the Immaculata, Miguel Bordas, welcomes us into St. Maximilian's room at the association's headquarters. In this very cell, they met with the permission of their superiors and founded this very simple, very humble association whose mission was precisely to convert themselves, to be saints, but to also convert everyone, especially the most distant and enemies of the church. In the original statute, the desire was to convert the schismatics and Freemasons. In short, the people who are in some way that fight against the church because they are the souls who most need to hear about Jesus through Immaculate Mary.
What I have here is the exactly the first edition of the Rycerz Niepokalany, because this is the Polish title of, of Rycerz, of the Night of the Immaculate. And uh, as you can see, it's, uh, of course, it's a reprinted version, because here you can see the, uh, the logo of the anniversary, of the 100th anniversary of Rycerz Niepokalany. And as you can see, it was very, very simple stuff, you know. It's like 16 pages, everything together, and it was written in very simple language. What we find here is, you know, the word from the reduction, the editorial one, when uh, in this first issue, San Maximian is introducing all the idea of printing the Rysasz Niepokalany. Father Tomasz says that the first article after the introduction is a recommendation from St. Maximilian on how to become happy. After 100 years, St. Maximilian's little magazine has multiplied into 30 editions published in different countries, the majority of which bear the name Knight of the Immaculata as an act of homage to the first one founded by St. Maximilian Kolbe in Poland. What was the secret to St. Maximilian Maria Kolbe's success? The answer can be found in the archives of the shrine built by the saint in Nieapakalan of Poland. The archivist, Sister Anna Maria, reveals St. Maximilian's formula for success. Very simple. Our little, uh, little W equals big W. And that means our little will, when it's united to God, we become holy that way. 